It was one month of wonderful playoff left hockey. And I don't know if it's going to mean anything entering this coming NHL season. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in the same place that you found this. The run was 7-1-3 and three leading into when the Penguins were mathematically eliminated for making the playoffs. That, of course, being before their regular season finale on Long Island. 7-1-3. and three. And within that, they had resounding victories over the Hurricanes, over the Rangers, over the Capitals, over the Lightning. And just in general, they played really sound, responsible, and occasionally dynamic hockey. Even in the games that they lost, they had a consistent feel about them for the first time, of course, all season long. And one of the things that really stands out for me about that night in Long Island, and bear in mind, again, they entered that game knowing they were out. But in speaking with Marcus Pedersen, Brian Rust, Sidney Crosby, the one sense that I got from them above all, was that this should mean something going into the following season. Now, sometimes that's just wishful thinking. Athletes who are conditioned the way NHL players are, they put so much work in, so much effort in, and then when the season ends, it's just poof, it's gone. Just somebody walks into the room and pulls the plug. And it's a difficult reality, they'll tell you, to deal with. And I'm not going to lie, I wondered about it myself. In talking to Mike Sullivan later that night outside the room, I got a similar impression from him where he wanted it to be something that they could carry into the next season. But then you also know, as a professional at the highest level of the sport, that there are going to be changes to the roster. There are going to be, in some cases, significant changes to the roster. Also, and hardly irrelevant, There's a lot of time that goes by. So whatever you felt, whatever the emotion was, whatever the fire, whatever the camaraderie, it's naturally just going to fade off. You're not going to see in a couple of months the Penguins get together in Cranberry and say, yeah, let's go get them, pick up right where we left off. It's just that's not how it goes. It's just not. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all your summer sports needs this season, from Major League Baseball, golf, NHL, NBA playoffs. Get the latest odds and lines, including all team matchups, player props, odds on just about everything that's out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Now, that said... The one area in which I'd have hope for any of this to linger in a positive way would be this. They were reminded, the Penguins, all of them, that the way in which they're going to win with this group at this age, using this system under this coach with this core of players is to defend first and foremost. It doesn't mean you have to be passive. It doesn't mean you have to sit back and wiggle your sticks at the red line. It just means, as Sullivan often likes to preach, that you don't hand away easy chances to the opponent. In fact, you make things very, very difficult for the opponent. When they have possession. That, my friends, held up over the entire month. In fact... There were certain spells when the opponent would gain really clear possession in their zone, and the Penguins, rather than wasting their time and wasting their energy doing pointless forechecks that are just aimed at smoking you out so you can go one direction or the other, they would be smarter about it. They would wait on that. Even the top line, even Sid, they'd wait on it. 
And then they would start pouncing when they felt they had the right opportunity. That's the kind of hockey they have to play. Now, if I can sneak in another possible positive out of the lingering effect here, it'd be that these are really going to be a lot of the same players. You know what's funny? You know what made me think of this subject for this episode today? It was seeing the photographs that came out of Pedersen's wedding yesterday over in Sweden and seeing a lot of the guys in the picture who were there. It wasn't just Swedes, by the way. It wasn't just Eric Carlson and Ricard Raquel. Drew O'Connor was in the shot. DOC flew all the way over to Sweden to be part of this wedding. They're becoming, you know, something of a, of a group, of a family. And that's good because, again, if you look at some of these contracts or some of the lengths for which the Penguins hold the rights to these players, they're going to be around a while. You might as well have everybody getting tight, but also getting on the same page from the hockey standpoint. They did that in going 7-3-1, and one, in nearly making the playoffs. It took forever to figure things out, but they did. And even though most coaches... In most big league settings, don't like to carry over anything from one season to the next. I'll bet, I'll bet Sullivan makes an exception in this specific regard. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Alan, and it's in regards to the Friday episode that I led with a discussion about the updated view of the Jake Gensel trade. Alan asks, DK, do you think that that Jake was going to try free agency unless he was offered what he ended up signing for with the Lightning? I hated to see him go, but it seems like a decent return for a guy the Penguins likely didn't have the cap space to keep. As I've said all along, Alan, the Penguins had the cap space. They could always have found the cap space. It's whether or not that's how they wanted to utilize it. I could still sit here in front of you right now and come up with an argument in favor of keeping Gensel even at that price. That said, and I know nobody likes it whenever they're listening to somebody either on a podcast or the radio or whatever who offers some kind of 50-50 thing. Everybody wants their super hot burning takes and whatever. I'm I'm right down the middle on this one at this stage. I really am. Because after how this turned out for Carolina management, after hearing from the Penguins about their legitimate excitement over some of what they've gotten back, in the Gensel trade, and after seeing with our own eyes what Michael Bunting offered, this could become something that's a nice exchange at the right time for the Penguins. Now, I could also throw all of that out in a heartbeat if, for whatever reason, Sidney Crosby wasn't able to adapt to Drew O'Connor and Brian Rust as being his line or vice versa. And that that would somehow accelerate Sid's fall from grace or whatever. You can tell I'm really stretching it here, right? We already saw in that winning stretch that I described in the opening segment today that Sid and Rust learned how to feed off of DOC's forechecking. And it has to be in that order. DOC doesn't have to adapt to them as much as the other way around because he's the first one on the puck. They need to be able to trust that if they get it deep, DOC is going to win it. They also need to trust that if DOC wins it, they're going to put themselves into the right spots to capitalize on that, wherever that might happen to be up to and including the DOC will win the puck outright and make plays, which he does a lot of the time. He's really, really, really good at this facet of hockey. And I'm straying from your Jake question, and I don't mean to. Jake is going to earn his money wherever he'd be. If you're asking if the Gensel side of this foresaw that he would receive an offer of this scope and had mapped this out, 
I'm going to share with you what I know from having dealt with that side over the past few months, and that is that no, no, they didn't. No, this wasn't some sort of master plan or scheme. Jake was stunned and dismayed at everything else that the Penguins didn't keep him when they, and by that I mean the Penguins, even though they were being run by other hockey ops people at the time, kept a lot of other guys like Rust, like Ricard Raquel, and he'd always kind of thought of himself as being someone who'd be of similar, you know, desirability. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. 